Tonight, with time running out, urgent calls to help bring more Afghans to Canada. We're going at night, door to door, looking for the interpreters' houses and trying to kill their family. Former interpreters for the Canadian Army rally in front of the Minister of Immigration's office tonight, worried for their families in Afghanistan, who are now targets of the Taliban. Plus... I am reiterating my call to the province to implement a vaccine certificate program. Peel's top doctor says if the Ford government doesn't bring in vaccine certificates, the region could come up with its own plan. But Ford's team is standing firm, saying passports aren't in their plan. And... It's great, and you can learn your black culture. Learn about, you can learn about yourself. A Toronto program aimed at supporting black students and helping them get in touch with their roots wants to expand and is hoping the province can help. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Local calls for Canada to further intervene in the crisis in Afghanistan are growing stronger tonight. Dozens of protesters gathered outside the Minister of Immigration's office tonight, many of them former interpreters for the Canadian Army, worried for their families back in Afghanistan, who they say are now targets of the Taliban. Our Dali Ashri reports. All what we want is... A cry for help from dozens of former Afghan interpreters, many of them now Canadian citizens, desperate to save their family members trapped in Afghanistan. Ahmed Sayed is a former interpreter who organized today's protest. We fight against Taliban face to face. So now the Taliban, they have control of the country. They are going at night, door to door, looking for the interpreters' houses and trying to kill their family. Another former interpreter who goes by the name Jasser Rahim came to Canada in 2011. We are not revealing his identity. He's worried his former role will put his family in grave danger. I used to work for the Canadian Army in their mission in Kandahar from 2008 to till 2011. They're trying to target my family members right now. Rahim's family sent him these photos of what was once his father's home destroyed by the Taliban. His family forced to flee to Kabul, no longer having any place to call home. Ryerson Maybe is a retired captain with the Canadian Army who mentored the Afghan National Army and worked closely with interpreters. It's not just the language that you need to pick up. There's social cues, uh, there's environmental indicators, and these guys were always on top of that stuff, and that's what kept me alive and kept a lot of my colleagues uh, alive as well. So far, 1,000 Afghans have made it safely to Canada. The Minister of Immigration was not at his campaign office today. His staff telling CBC he's hard at work on evacuation efforts. Rahim says he's filed an application three times to bring his family here. I didn't have any reply back and I put as urgent evacuation evacuation for my family which they live with no accommodation in Kabul but no one is responding to me. Maybe suggests a separate and faster application process for families of former interpreters. They need to change the documentary process that they're putting people through right now. Uh, right now it's it's like the regular immigration process except that it's happening in a place where people have guns to their heads. All what we want is... And time is running out. A government source confirming to CBC News that last Canadian-operated flight out of Kabul airport is expected to leave on Thursday. As the crisis continues to escalate in Afghanistan, now the pressure is on the Canadian government to help get people out of Kabul in less than 24 to 48 hours. Dahlia Ashri, CBC News, Toronto. The U.S. is holding firm on their August 31st deadline for its troops to withdraw from the country. But American officials pledged that the military airlift from Kabul would continue into the final hours. The effort to bring out of Afghanistan those who want to leave does not end uh, with the military uh, evacuation um, plan uh, on the 31st. Uh, we are very focused on what we need to do. Uh, to facilitate the uh, the further departure of people who wish to leave Afghanistan. Uh, and that is primarily going to be a diplomatic effort, a consular effort, uh, an international effort, uh, because other countries feel exactly, uh, exactly the same way. Blinken added that more than two dozen countries are helping to transport or resettle those who are being evacuated. He said that's the product of intense diplomatic efforts to secure resettlement agreements. 
to COVID-19 now, where after two days of dipping cases, infections are now rising again. Today, we're seeing 660 new infections registered in the province. Almost half of these new cases are in unvaccinated people. The province also says one more COVID death was reported today. The seven-day average has now jumped to 625, quadrupling what we saw from last month when the average was just over 150. The Ontario Hospital Association is renewing calls for broader COVID-19 vaccinations as hospitalizations and intensive care admissions due to the virus continue to rise. In a statement issued today, the head of the OHA says increasing the vaccination rate will help reduce the burden on hospitals. The number of people in intensive care in Ontario with COVID-19 has now surpassed 150. That was the threshold at which the province last year said it would have to start cutting back on surgeries. The Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Kieran Moore, said yesterday the province currently has the capacity to care for those in intensive care, but will closely monitor the situation. And calls are growing for the province to introduce a vaccine certificate program. Today, Peel's top doctor added his voice to the mix. Dr. Lawrence Lowe saying if the province doesn't make a move, he'll look at creating a regional program. Our Lorena Redekop reports. These vaccine certificates are used in Quebec, Manitoba has them, and now BC will be adding them. With Ontario saying no, Peel's medical officer says it's looking at another idea. At this time, Peel Public Health is also actively exploring with other health units what could be done locally on a vaccine certificate program absent a provincial solution. That's as more and more sports and concert venues, as well as workplaces, are announcing that they'll soon require proof of vaccination. Toronto's mayor says this should come from the province, but said this. I just uh, would be quite willing to cooperate with anybody, including the federal government, the province, or other cities, to just make sure we get it done and then get some proper guidelines out as to when and where it should be used so that people can be reassured, both employers and venue operators and the public at large. A spokesperson for the health minister didn't respond to questions on whether the province plans to release guidelines on when companies can ask for proof of vaccination. But she says a form of proof is already available. People can go to the vaccination website and enter their information then download a PDF version. She says it's secure and contains a watermark. We've had uh, people come to us and say that, they're, that what they have now is not recognized. Um, we were promised, uh, we, I brought it up with the ministry as well, the federal one will be more of an internationally recognized document. Um, if that comes before, fine, but my impression is that it'll take a, long, it'll take a while until the federal one is done. So I think we do need one over, uh, you know, in the sort of more uh, near future for Ontario. This infectious diseases expert says if Ontario does ever decide to add these certificates, he could see it happening in late fall when case numbers are expected to be higher to avoid a lockdown. I think a vaccine certificate um, is best used in place where people are going to be uh, indoors uh, congregating for a prolonged period of time. So I think uh, one of the best places uh, that I can think of in the Peel region is in the manufacturing sector in factories. But at this point, it doesn't appear the province will add a certificate, leaving it to businesses and possibly health regions to figure out their own systems. Lorenda Redekamp, CBC News, Toronto. Air Canada says it is now requiring all airline employees and new hires to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. The announcement makes Air Canada the first major Canadian airline to mandate vaccines for all employees. Toronto's Porter Airlines announced last week that it would be requiring all employees to either be fully vaccinated or to present a negative COVID-19 test within three days of their shift. Air Canada says that testing will not be offered as an alternative to mandatory vaccinations. And a heat warning remains in effect for the city of Toronto. People in the city are trying to beat the sweltering heat. Now, the warning went into effect on Monday. It's expected to last well into Thursday. Eight of Toronto's outdoor pools are running with extended hours, closing at 11.45 tonight. Two emergency cooling centres are also open for 24 hours. Meteorologist Nick Srnkovich joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Nick, still hot, still humid, nothing new. Well, I feel like a bit of a broken record here, Calda. We were looking at temperatures in the 30s, humid X values approaching 40, and heat warnings 
in effect yet again for uh, basically all of southern Ontario. Here's a look at some of the afternoon temperatures that we had. Uh, Toronto up to 31 degrees today. Uh, winds are up to 29 degrees. When you factor it in the Humidex though, Humidex values were close to that 40 mark. Uh, 39 down in Windsor actually did peak at 39 in Toronto as well. So heat and humidity in place. We've had some isolated showers throughout the day as well. But generally speaking, it's actually stayed fairly dry. Last night we had rain down in uh, Windsor and southwestern Ontario. But for today, for the most part, just some cloud cover. Tomorrow I think we're going to trigger off some isolated cells uh, along a lake breeze front. But other than that, uh, for the GTA as a whole, should generally remain dry. Here's a look at your forecast for the next 24. 22 degrees tonight, 30 on the humid X for the overnight low. Tomorrow's high of 31 degrees and a slight chance of a few showers. Your full forecast in just a bit. Thanks, Nick. It's day 11 of the federal election campaign. During a stop in Surrey, British Columbia, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau expanded on his promise to make housing more affordable. He said he would boost taxes on banks and insurance companies to pay for the plan. We will raise the corporate income tax rate for Canada's largest and most profitable banks and insurance companies by three percentage points on all earnings over a billion dollars. We'll also establish the Canada Recovery Dividend so these institutions contribute more over the next four years of Canada's recovery. All of Canada's big banks have been reporting huge quarterly profits this week. Trudeau was dogged by hecklers again today. At least one of them also harangued Trudeau yesterday in Hamilton, Ontario. As Prime Minister, I will double the current federal commitment to the growth of health funding making an additional $60 billion available for health and mental health over the next 10 years. This will be the largest increase in federal health spending in a generation. Healthcare spending was at the centre of Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's campaign announcement today. Along with the $60 billion, he also pledged $1 billion to programs tailored to Indigenous communities. In this difficult time, when people have needed their internet access more than ever to use to access for work, for school, for services. We know that this is a necessity. People need it and it should be affordable. And NDP leader Jagmeet Singh dialed in on cell phone and internet fees during his stop in Windsor. He accused the Liberals of breaking their promise to bring costs down. As Singh says the federal government has the authority to control cell and internet fees and that he would use that power if elected. Welcome back. A Toronto program aimed at supporting and showcasing black students is looking for continued funding from the Ministry of Education. The Ready Summer Program merges academic excellence with Afrocentric cultural immersion for students in kindergarten to grade 12. Now it finishes in September, but organizers are hoping for a funding boost in order to expand in the future. Natalie Collada has the story. It's a space and summer program that is not only readying black students for September, but also making them feel safe. Like sometimes I feel like, like my classmates, they would make some racist comments and like I, I wouldn't like that and like it's hurtful. For 10 year old Jeremiah Takiana, the Ready program has made all the difference. You can make lots of friends, it's, it's great and you can learn your black culture. About, you can learn about yourself. And that, say organizers, is exactly the point. Without a doubt, the statistics are showing that this model works. When you have black children in a program that is academically strong, with high expectations, coupled with a culturally affirming and safe space, they excel. The program provides academic support and Afrocentric cultural immersion to ready black students for kindergarten to grade 12 for the upcoming school year. My kids uh, go to public school in York Region and uh, my son is in a French immersion school. So even more so for him, he doesn't see children that look like him and he doesn't see educators that look like him. So coming to a program like this, even though it's only been a couple of weeks, is a spirit uplifting. Martin says a survey of participants found 86% reported an increase in confidence and feeling safe. The need for the program not only to continue but expand, she says, is great. We have parents that are coming as far away as Ajax 
parents coming from Brampton, from downtown Toronto. We had a parent in Hamilton that wanted to come. In a statement to CBC, a ministry spokesperson says we recognize that black and racialized students have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, which is why we partnered and invested in programs like Ready to combat racism and promote academic success for black students. While Ontario remains the only level of government to support the critical work undertaken by Anchor, we do hope all levels of government will also step up to support their work and the success of black students and their families. The program wraps up this week, but organizers hope it will be back next year. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Vaughan. Mainly clear tonight with a few cloudy periods overnight. Currently, it's 26 degrees in downtown Toronto, but feeling more like 35 with that humidex. All right, let's go back to Nick now with a look at your extended forecast. And Nick, we're getting closer to some relief from this heat, but tonight at least still hot and muggy. Well, Kelda, I feel like we're living in the movie Groundhog Day. The weather just keeps repeating itself um, and really nothing has changed for the last five or so. The headlines, however, I have shifted them a little bit and here's the reason why. Now, the heat warnings remain in effect. That was our headline yesterday as well. The Humidex, though, through the overnight tonight, 30. That's going to be the low for tonight and then relief on the way for Friday. So um, that's what we're tracking here as we move through the next few days. Here's a look at the uh, precipitation outlook. Uh, generally speaking, clear skies. We've got uh, some cloud cover that's going to roll through for the morning. But as we get some afternoon heating, I think we are going to trigger off some isolated showers and thunderstorms. Potential for that in the GTA, especially along the west end. And then uh, as the sun sets, things generally clear out. Into Friday, though, scattered showers starting in southwestern Ontario and then moving across into the GTA. In terms of tonight, we've got uh, forecast temperatures down to 21, 22 degrees. Again, a few very light isolated showers in southwestern Ontario, but for the most part, it's clear. And then tomorrow, uh, Humidex values around 42, heat warnings in effect, isolated showers again. So this looks bad, but it's really not. These are isolated showers, so not an all-day washout event for you in southwestern Ontario. Golden Horseshoe, similar temperatures, 22 degrees, overnight Humidex of 30 that's the low and that's as uh, that's the highest that we've seen it um, uh, actually in in recent memory uh, humidex tomorrow up to about 40 temperatures around 31 degrees a mix of sun and cloud we will trigger off a few isolated thunderstorms but whether you see it or not about a 30 percent chance of seeing that uh, for tomorrow Five-day forecast, better chance of seeing some showers on uh, Friday, highs to 24 degrees. There's the relief that we're looking at, but the temperatures start to climb through the weekend, and Humidex values by Sunday back up to about 38. Kelda. Thanks, Nick. Guevara is battling to keep pace. Mars finishes third. A strong opening to the Paralympics on day one for Canada. Aurélie Rivard captured a bronze at the Tokyo 2020 Games. She took the medal in the women's 50-meter freestyle S10 event. Rivard was the defending champion, winning gold in Rio in 2016. Keely Shaw of Saskatchewan got Canada its first medal. Equestrian events begin today at the Tokyo Paralympic Games and Toronto's Jody Schloss competes with her beloved horse Lieutenant Lovin later this week. And it's not her first Paralympics. She competed in London 2012 and says she's more prepared than ever. Our Jessica Ng reports. At a riding hall near Hamilton, Team Canada's Jody Schloss shows an effortless command of the horse she affectionately calls Lovin. This week, the veteran rider takes on Tokyo in team and grade one individual dressage. Her passion for horses dates back to childhood. Well before a terrifying car accident at age 23, she suffered a serious brain injury, leaving her in a wheelchair and affecting her speech. Especially with her voice. People don't see her. 
People don't see her as a capable person. In the hospital, her brother Michael says it was Jody's love of horses that helped her heal. The neurologist, the doctors, said to play her songs she was familiar with, and especially scents that she would find familiar and sort of to, to stimulate her brain. I'm the owner of the barn. And the owner of the barn. Came to the hospital. With horse tack. With horse tack. Otherwise known as equestrian equipment, reminding her of her love of the sport. Within eight years of the accident, she was back on a horse, thanks to the Community Association for Riders with Disabilities. And the physios. Her physios said they could tell when she had been riding. Because her core was so much stronger. Strength that's evident to Michael. It's just amazing to see her come here day after day, drive an hour here from home, five days a week, to come ride and to come improve her skills. Coach Karis Van Essen says it's her tenacity that makes Jody one to watch in Tokyo. She doesn't see any limitations. She doesn't let anything really stop her. Um, she's very focused, very determined, um, and she's incredible in the way that she can really adapt. In January, the Paralympian published a book of poetry and inspirational stories called From Anguish to Hope. She writes, for I have seen the horses running and they're in my blood like fire. You're riding great, Joe. The Toronto bred rider hopes to trot and canter her way to a Paralympic medal for Canada. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Chris Glover has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.